Hello everybody, I'm Paul Cawthorn. The Conservative and then Ulster Unionist politician Enoch Powell reveled in challenging established orthodoxies. He frequently provoked controversy and sometimes helped to establish the future agenda. Powell is best known for his outspoken opposition to immigration, which shattered a tacit consensus between the political parties not to inflame public opinion on the issue. Speaking in 1968, the former classical scholar alluded to the poet Virgil to make a prediction of racial violence. Like the Roman, I seem to see the river Tiber foaming with much blood. Powell also adopted distinctive positions on a range of other prominent issues in the post-1945 era. Once a committed imperialist, Powell later called for the UK to adopt a more tightly defined international role. In doing so, Amid international Cold War tensions, he rejected what can be seen as the twin pillars of British policy, alliance with the United States and the independent nuclear deterrent. He eventually came even to advocate an alliance with the Soviet Union. Despite his deep suspicion of US ambitions, Powell emerged as an early proponent of free market economics. In doing so, he prefigured some of the policy changes introduced by Margaret Thatcher's governments in the 1980s. As the UK sought membership of the European community, Powell strongly opposed the move. He emphasized the threat to British sovereignty, an argument that has resonated in British politics and public life from the 1990s and has played a big part in recent debates over Brexit. Yet if Powell's views on Europe have appeared to endure, his stance on Northern Ireland has weathered less well. A fierce opponent of devolution in Scotland and Wales, Powell argued against a backdrop of the troubles for the closer integration of Northern Ireland with Great Britain. This view most certainly put Powell out of line with a large part of Ulster Unionist opinion, which strove to regain local legislative control. His view was also at odds with the eventually successful British government strategy, seeking a power sharing arrangement between the local parties and increasingly envisaging the Republic of Ireland playing an important role in the resolution of the conflict. But this does not, I think, detract from the significance of Powell's debate, Powell's, Powell's contribution in the still ongoing debate over devolution in the UK, which is really what I want to explore today. As a historian of 20th century Britain, I'd long been fascinated by Powell as a widely read intellectual figure, but also one who was at the same time a populist politician. It was not until after I moved to Belfast, however, to take up a lectureship at Queen's University, that I began to research Powell myself. I knew that far less had been written about Powell as an Ulster Unionist MP between 1974 and 1987 than about his involvement in British politics. As I familiarized myself with local archives, I began to find plenty of underexploited material. This notably included the numerous pamphlets held at the Linen Hall Library in its Northern Ireland political collection. These allowed me to understand who Powell was arguing against and who chose to take on his arguments. I had initially planned to write a single argument about, a single article about Powell, but I found myself increasingly drawn in. I decided to write a book about him, which was published last year. In the book, I look thematically at Powell's position on certain issues, international relations, economics, immigration, Europe and Northern Ireland. In each case, I try to understand the development of Powell's ideas and how and why he chose to invo invoke them, deploy them in particular political contexts. My talk today has four parts. First, I want to give some background on Powell. Then I want to look at how interpretations of Powell have evolved over time. Next, I'll look at Powell's analysis of the British nation and his policy of integration for Northern Ireland. In the final section, 
I want to place Powell in the context of Ulster unionist politics. Powell spent just 15 months in the British cabinet in the early 1960s, but he was, from the later part of that decade, one of the best known politicians in the UK. As Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher later put it, Powell commanded influence without power. Born in Birmingham in 1912, Powell initially had a successful academic career, which saw him become professor of Greek at the University of Sydney at the age of 25. Powell then served in the British Army during the Second World War, becoming a brigadier in military intelligence. Joining Conservative Central Office in 1946, he won the seat of Wolverhampton Southwest in 1950. Powell first held government office at the Ministry of Housing in 1955 and became Financial Secretary to the Treasury in 1957, resigning the following year when calls for reduction in public expenditure were dismissed by the Cabinet. As Minister for Health between 1960 and 1963, Powell joined the cabinet in July 1962, but left the following year after refusing to serve under new leader Sir Alec Douglas Hume. Powell entered the Conservative Party leadership contest in 1965, but came in last place. He was shadow defence minister from 1965, but was sacked by party leader Edward Heath after making his so-called Rivers of Blood speech in Birmingham in April 1968. With the Conservatives back in office after 1970, Powell's relations with the leadership deteriorated and deeply, deeply opposed to party policy in favour of membership of the European community, which became a reality in 1973, Powell decided not to stand in the February 1974 general election. Dramatically, Powell now asked his supporters to vote for the Labour Party that was committed to renegotiating the terms of UK membership and then putting these to a test of public opinion in a referendum. Powell subsequently made an unusual move for a British politician, choosing to contest a seat in Northern Ireland, South Down, for the Ulster Unionist Party, the UUP, in the October 1974 general election. He held this until defeated in 1987. Powell himself died in 1998. Let me turn now to consider interpretations of Powell. A great deal has been written about Powell, but a lot of it has been concerned with immigration. After making his speech in Birmingham, Powell was labeled racist or racialist in the language of the day by a range of opinion. But he also had substantial public support. Only two national newspapers supported Powell, the Daily Express and the News of the World, but they had a combined circulation of over 10 million. Overall, though, the assessment was critical. The year after the speech, the radical left-wing journalist Paul Foote published a book accusing Powell of coming late to the immigration debate and opportunistically exploiting racist sentiment only after coming to appreciate its potential value in electoral terms. In the 1970s and 1980s, a succession of social scientists increasingly associated with the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies at Birmingham University gave academic credibility to charges of racism. Amid what they saw as a post-colonial crisis facing Britain, they took issue with Powell's encoded interpretation of race in absolute terms and his equation of whiteness with Britishness. More recently, historians have examined how Powell stimulated unspoken memories of the racially ordered colonial past. They have considered Powell as part of a political generation shaped by the Second World War, whose reference points, including the danger of invasion, were applied to the post-colonial context. We should also remember, though, that since the late 1960s, these views have been consistently challenged by a range of more sympathetic Powell biographers who have contended that their subject was not crudely racist. There has also been a move in recent years to consider Powell's interests more widely. 
This development is particularly pronounced in the case of Europe, which, after Powell's own lifetime, became intertwined with the issue of immigration. Earlier waves of immigration into Britain came from the West Indies and then from India and Pakistan, but this changed in the new millennium. The 2004 EU enlargement included, among others, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Lithuania and Poland. With the government not restricting immigration from these states in the first five years of membership, by 2013, EU citizens formed the largest group of UK immigrants. This was the backdrop against which the Leave campaign's main slogan in the 2016 referendum to take back control, usually in effect, referred to control of the UK's borders. We now understand how Powell's campaigns on both immigration and Europe can be understood as populist in a classic sense, suggesting that the people were being misrepresented, even misled by government and party elites. This has been matched by a growing public awareness that Powell broadly outlined some of the arguments that in turn underpinned Brexit. An, argument, an article in the Financial Times at the very end of 2017 was probably exaggerating when it made the case that Powell is the politician who dominates our age as no other does. But it had a point in one sense when it went on to state that the age of Brexit is the age of Powell. Let me now turn to Powell's understanding of the British nation and his policy of integration for Northern Ireland. Powell considered that Northern Ireland was part of the British nation, defined by the geographical boundaries of the UK. Unionism, in Powell's reasoning, was therefore the claim to be part of a whole, the British nation. That was how Powell put it to an audience in Belfast in 1972. But Powell's views on the geographical boundaries of the British nation had changed over time. In the early 1950s, Powell was still an imperialist, arguing that, in its widest sense, the nation is the empire. But by 1954, he considered that the empire's disintegration was inevitable. <clears throat> This was not only because of the increasing independence of the dominions, including Australia, New Zealand and Canada, but also as a result of the existence within the British dominions of large populations unconnected with the United Kingdom by tradition or colour. Significantly, in 1961, with considerable decolonisation having taken place, Powell argued that the nationhood of the mother country remained unaltered through it all. He now contended that an acceptance of and an allegiance to the crown in parliament characterized the unbroken life of the English nation over a thousand years. Powell's views were not that distinctive. His attachment to parliamentary institutions made him part of a broad conservative tradition often seen as dating back to Edmund Burke in the 18th century. Moreover, from the mid 19th century to the 1950s, it was common to define the English nation in terms of the constitutional development of the crown in parliament. Unlike most others, Powell did, however, devote time to writing part of that history himself. This took the form of an account of the House of Lords in the, late, in the later Middle Ages. Powell was also far from unique especially among the English, in conflating England and Britain. Yet, from the mid-1950s, Powell started to talk more routinely about the British nation. At the Conservative Party conference in 1965, a shadow defence minister, he asked, what do we mean by the nation? And answered, we mean the United Kingdom. Powell's tendency to speak about the British nation was cemented from the late 1960s amid the rise of Scottish and to a lesser extent Welsh nationalism that threatened, as he put it, the unity of the realm. Powell held an institutional interpretation in which the British nation had developed from the English one. In his view, this had happened as the English Parliament incorporated Wales, Scotland and Ireland. 
This meant that both the Scottish Parliament and the Irish Parliament had ceased to exist in 1707 and 1800, the point at which the two acts of union. Powell considered that the British nation was a unitary state with all power, parliamentary sovereignty flowing from the centre. In the early 1970s, this was still a widely held opinion, but it was soon to be increasingly questioned. Nonetheless, Powell applied this viewpoint ferociously in the devolution debate. Powell had begun to take an active interest in Northern Ireland in 1968, making regular visits and establishing close relations with the Ulster Unionist Party. In early 1970, Powell argued that the Unionist assertion of oneness with the rest of the United Kingdom was at odds with their assertion of this parliamentary independence, that is, the commitment to Stormont. Given the Unionist attachment to Stormont that had become entrenched since the establishment of Northern Ireland, this was a deeply provocative argument to make. Nevertheless, it was, in one sense, a return to the agenda of the late 19th and early 20th century Unionists, most notably the academic jurist A.V. Dicey. Dicey contended that Irish Home Rule would undermine the fundamental principle of the British Constitution, the overriding sovereignty of the Crown in Parliament. Powell's argument also related directly to the Troubles, as he attributed to Stormont some responsibility for sustaining the tensions by giving the impression that Northern Ireland was separate from the rest of the UK. There was fleeting interest in, in, in integration after the suspension of Stormont in 1972, but on the whole, the arguments for integration did not publicly gain much ground. Indeed, even Powell's advocacy of it was muted as he claimed during his first campaign in South Down that he endorsed the agreed unionist policy of majority rule devolution within a future federal United Kingdom. With Scottish and Welsh devolution being debated, this was effectively devolution all round. To Northern Ireland audiences, Powell continued to tow the unionist line but speaking at Westminster expressed his real view. This was that the nature of the House of Commons is that its sovereignty reaches into every nook and cranny of national life. There are no powers which it will not concede to this realm in any other authority. Understandably, this brought a rebuke from Harry West, the UUP leader. It also caused upset in Powell's South Down constituency party. Powell's position was decidedly awkward. And as a result, he focused on promoting two policies that were consistent with an integrationist agenda without making this explicit. The policies were increased parliamentary representation at Westminster in the absence of a local devolved parliament and expanded local government whose functions had historically been restricted under devolution. Powell was close to James Molyneux, the UUP leader at Westminster, and he was successful in securing the principle of increased representation of Northern Ireland at Westminster in 1978. Over time, closer contacts were established between the UUP and the Conservative Party. The Conservative Northern Ireland Committee, set up after the suspension of Stormont and containing individuals amenable to integration such as Julian Amory and John Biggs Davison played an important role. The UUP and the Conservatives coalesced in support for the establishment of regional councils with wide ranging powers over local services. This was presented pragmatically by the UUP as what can be achieved now. Yet, after the Conservatives returned to power in 1979, the Thatcher government abandoned the regional council scheme and, seeking devolution, tried to establish a conference for the Northern Ireland political parties. With the UUP standing aside from the talks and theoretically still committed to regional councils, it now more visibly divided between those backing devolution and those supporting integration. To some extent, this remained the case 
for the rest of the 1980s. Let me now place Powell's arguments in political context. In the first place, Powell's views represented a challenge to calls for independence for Northern Ireland that had emerged out of the fractious politics of the UUP, with William Bill Craig playing the prominent role. Craig had begun to call for greater autonomy from Britain from 1968. From February 1972, advocacy of greater independence was intertwined with the emergence of the Ulster Vanguard movement, a pressure group within the UUP. Set up just before the suspension of Stormont, its constitution spoke of bolstering the Parliament of Northern Ireland. Yet Craig was soon arguing that it was not possible to remain in the UK, that if it was not possible to remain in the UK, he favoured some form of friendly dominion status under the crown. The dominion status argument had some pedigree. In the years after 1945, in the context of decolonization, it had underpinned calls for greater fiscal independence. Powell was emphatic in his response. He argued that independence would mean turning unionism into that denial of itself, isolationism. Powell directly refuted the implications of the vanguard publication, Ulster, a nation. Powell did not accept that there was any such thing as an Ulster nationality or Ulster nationalism. He accepted that within the British nation, there was an Ulster dimension, but he saw this as being like other regional dimensions in Britain. Powell's views were also a significant challenge to the deeply held Ulster Unionist commitment to majority rule devolution. Until 1972, it is fair to say that this characterized Ulster Unionism as a whole. Even as the troubles unfolded, this was the line taken by the Ulster Unionist government at Stormont. In 1971, Brian Faulkner, the last Northern Ireland Prime Minister, argued that the meaning, however hard, of democracy was that the will of the majority must decide fundamental issues. It was also the view of those unionists who criticized the government for being too willing to bow to pressure from London for reform. Ian Paisley, the founder of the Pre Free Presbyterian Church and the Democratic Unionist Party, the DUP, made a particular call for Stormont to regain control over security. This had been lost with the deployment of the British Army. After Stormont's suspension, both the Orange Order and the UUP called for its restoration. Amid the volatile politics that followed, the advocacy of majority rule devolution passed to the United Ulster Unionist Council, the Triple UC. This was an electoral coalition comprising the UUP, the DUP, and what had become the Vanguard Unionist Progressive Party. It was set up in early 1974 in order to oppose the Sunningdale Agreement that envisaged a power-sharing Northern Ireland executive and a cross-border Council of Ireland. The Triple UC case for devolution was increasingly underpinned by a criticism of British political parties with the claim made that they only acted in their own party interest. At this point, this was a powerful argument to make. It chimed with a growing public and media dissatisfaction with the British political system, its institutions and its politicians. This had begun to develop in the 1950s and it gathered pace in the course of the 1980s, 1970s. By the end of the decade, with the collapse of the UC in 1977 and with the UUP divided in practice between integrationist and devolutionist wings, the DUP positioned itself as the unambiguously pro-devolution party, continuing to call for majority rule. This was accompanied by a growing feud between Powell and Paisley, which in 1979 had involved speculation that the DUP would challenge Powell in South Down. Against this backdrop, Powell developed the case behind his call for integration and in doing so, challenged some of the arguments underpinning the call for devolution. Countering the suggestion 
that a power sharing local assembly was needed to protect the interests of the nationalist minority in Northern Ireland. Powell contended, Parliament is the natural protect protector of all minorities because it is itself made up of minorities. This was because, both politically and geographically, the consciousness that they are all minorities prevents them from coercing or trampling upon one another. Devolution in any form, the old Stormont regime, as well as a power sharing model, would only work to override the safeguards. Powell argued, if Ulster is endowed with the attributes of a separate state, all the proportions are changed. Differences which, diluted within the union as a whole, were harmless and tolerated, become critically important. This was, in a very important sense, a rebuttal of the pervasive view that party interest dominated Westminster in a negative way. Yet it also led Powell to confront the biggest and most significant difference between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, the differing party structure. Making it clear how this related to local political minorities, Powell argued, when in the county of Durham, the conservative minority contemplates the fact that it is unlikely to return a majority of members to this house or vice versa in Hampshire, it feels no estrangement as a result because it identifies itself with the cause of the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, as the case may be, throughout the nation. Even so, Powell did not publicly endorse electoral integration, British political parties organising in Northern Ireland. He did later privately acknowledge, though, that in principle, he supported it. In fact, when there was a significant call for electoral integration, it involved an important challenge to Powell's thinking. After the 1985 Anglo-Irish Agreement, the UUP politician Robert McCartney argued that British citizens in Northern Ireland are denied the most important political right of being able, if they choose, to vote for a party which might, conceivably, form the government of the country of which they are alleged to be equal citizens. McCartney soon became president of the newly formed Campaign for Equal Citizenship. It was one of the campaign supporters, however, the Ulster Union University politics academic Arthur Ochi, who spelled out the challenge to Powell's arguments. Responding to Irish nationalism as well, Ochi argued that for unionists, the question is not about nationality, it is about the state. He continued, unionism is concerned primarily, primarily with the quality of citizenship within the union. It is nationalists who are agitated by ideas of nationhood and its extent. There are, there is no British nation, there are only British citizens. Let me bring things to a close. Powell's deep involvement in Northern Irish politics over the better part of 20 years was highly unusual for a British politician. Yet in articulating his Ulster unionism during this time, he gave one of the fullest expositions of his understanding of the British nation. With his emphasis on the primacy of Westminster, his unionism can be viewed in terms of a late 19th, early 20th century agenda. Yet Powell also moved the argument forward. Tentatively endorsing electoral integration he made a case for the importance of political parties as a pivotal part of the parliamentary system and the central political means by which the electorate identified with the nation. Powell actually preempted by several years the burst of interest in British political party organization in Northern Ireland that occurred in the mid and late 1980s. But the irony was that by the time it came, it posed a challenge to Powell's most fundamental belief, his belief in the existence of the British nation. Thank you very much.